The topic is clinical features of gingiva. Let's go into detail. Now, this clinical features of gingiva, we can cover it under certain subheadings. That is, color of the gingiva, the con contour, the consistency, the surface texture, size, shape, and then position. And the final thing is bleeding on probing. So, let's see what happens in health, the color of the gingiva, what are the reasons associated with the color, and what happens in pathology. If you see the color, the first subheading would be color of the gingiva. In health, usually the color of the gingiva is coral pink. Now, this coral pink appearance is basically because of three important factors that affect the color or give the color to the gingiva. The three important factors is the vascular supply, the associated vascular supply within the connective tissue, the thickness of the epithelium, and the degree of keratinization of the epithelium. Apart from that, sometimes the patients will have some kind of a melanin pigmentation within the gingiva. So, now the presence of melanin pigment producing cells also varies according to patient to patient and it can produce the so color change within the gingiva. Now, this melanin pigmentation can be seen in isolated areas or it can be seen in a patch-like or an patch-like areas or it can be seen as a continuous band of melanin pigmentation. And then the scoral pink gingiva is most often seen in the Caucasians and very, very, uh, it, it's not appreciated as a coral pink gingiva in the Indian population. But then if you see the African uh, population, they mostly have this increased melanin pigmentation in their gingiva. Now, if you, what, if you, what happens in disease? Now, the color changes that happen that you can appreciate as it progresses to a diseased stage, that is, your inflammatory stage or any other kind of disease. Now, let's see in chronic gingivitis, what is the color that is seen? Either the gingiva would be red or it will be reddish blue or it can be bluish or it can be a deep blue in color. Whereas in acute gingival conditions, usually the gingiva will be erythematous, okay? And then it will be bright red or it will be erythematous. If there is some ingestion of any kind of a heavy metals like lead, bismuth, mercury, there can be a heavy metal pigmentation. Now this is because of the perivascular precipitation of this particular heavy metals in the circulation because you know in a gingivitis there is increased vasculature your vascular vasculature is dilated so there can be a precipitation of these minerals into the perivascular area which can give a typical kind of a color one of the color that is caused by lead is called as a bertonian line Apart from that, coming to the second category, that is the contour. What is the normal contour of your gingiva? Your marginal gingiva is always scalloped with knife-edged margins. Whereas your interdental papilla, in the anterior areas, it is pyramidal in shape and in the posterior areas, it is tent-shaped. You know it is pyramidal in shape in the anterior areas because the point of contact in the anterior areas is a point contact, whereas in your posterior areas, the two teeth contact at a surface. So there is a larger surface area of contact between the posterior teeth. Therefore, it is tent-shaped. Your lingual and your buccal papilla, they don't join together as a pyramid, but they join because of the interdental call as a tent. Right. Now, what are the reasons which are responsible for the normal scalloping and the knife-edged and the pyramidal shape of the gingiva? I told you for the for the a pyramidal uh, or the anterior, it's mainly related to the proximal contact, the location and the size of the proximal contact and the dimensions of the facial and lingual embrasures. But for the scalloped and the uh, knife edge, what are the reasons would be because of the shape of the tooth and the alignment in the arch. Now, in disease, in chronic gingivitis, the marginal gingiva will become rolled and rounded and then the knife edges can become blunt and then your interdental papillary tips can become again blunt, okay, and sometimes uh, blunt and even flat sometimes. In acute conditions, like for example, your anag, acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, your interdental or the tip of the interdental papilla might show punched out crater-like depressions. Apart from that, sometimes you can get, get an exaggerated scalloping. For example, 
In case of your gingival recession, there can be an exaggerated scalloping. And the other alterations in your contour would include your McCall's festoons and your Stillman's clefts. Now, these Stillman's clefts are nothing but apostrophe shaped uh, clefts which are present within the gingival margin. And then your McCall's festoons are nothing but a life preserver shaped uh, uh, kind of a gingival enlargement, which is seen especially in the canine and the premolar areas. Now let's talk about the consistency of your uh, gingiva. In normal conditions, the consistency of the gingiva is firm and resilient. What are the reasons for this firm and resiliency of the normal gingiva? There are three reasons which explains the normal consistency of the gingiva. There is a firm and resilient property. First is because of the collagenous nature of your underlying gingival connective tissue. You know your gingival connective tissue is mostly composed of type 1 collagen fibers and your type 3 collagen fibers which are arranged in form of buttons, right? And then they're contiguity with the mucoperiosteum. You know your gingival connective tissue is continuous with the underlying periosteum of the alveolar bone. You know the outer covering of the alveolar bone or outer covering of the bone is called as a periosteum. So your attached gingiva is continuous with that of your underlying periosteum and because of this it can be a reason for the firm and resilient property. Apart from that, the cellular and the fluid content of the tissues. So there's a balance between the cellular and the fluid content of the tissues, which is giving the resilient property. Your ground substances, that is your proteoglycans and glycoproteins. The proteoglycans are large molecular uh, structures and these structures have the capacity to imbibe water. The minute you, press, uh, you apply some pressure from an external surface, what happens is the uh, there is a pressure over these ground substance molecules that is your proteoglycans and they liberate out water. The minute you remove the uh, uh, pressure, external pressure, again these molecules will imbibe the water and then they will keep this uh, the balance in the tissue, the fluid balance in the tissues and the resilient property is mainly related to that. If you see in disease, in chronic gingivitis what happens, the consistency changes to soft and puffy feeling okay and then in an exudative kind of a, a, a condition you have marked softness and friability so the tissues are more friable or thin and they are very fragile if you see the fibrotic kind of uh, uh, gingivitis or fibrotic kind of a gingival disease that usually the tissues are firm and they are leathery in consistency whereas in acute conditions there is for example your anag there is sloughing of your entire uh, epithelium and your little bit of connection Connective tissue. With a, sometimes, if you, if you see your un, your acute pri, uh, your primary uh, herpetic gingival stomatitis, there are vesicle formation. So this is the alterations that you can see in case of your uh, consistency. Now let's see the size. Now what constitutes to the normal size of the gingiva? When you say it's normal, you mean to say that there is a balance between the cellular and the extracellular content. To call it as a cell, uh, to call it as the size of the uh, gingiva, you include your cellular and the extracellular content. In the extracellular content includes your fibers and the ground substance. So the total, the sum total bulk of your cellular and the intercellular substances together will constitute the size of your gingiva. So any alteration in any of it, whether there is an increase in the cells or increase in the intercellular substances or increase in the fibers or the ground substances can produce a kind of a gingival enlargement right well, and it is also the normal size is also related to your vascular supply now what is the normal shape of your gingiva now the shape of the gingiva mainly depends on the proximal contact or the proximal tooth and the location and the shape of the gingival embrasure so if you don't have a proximal contact what happens there is a flat interdental gingiva. Actually, there is no interdental papilla. The interdental gingiva is completely flat because it is taking the shape of your underlying alveolar bone. Now, let's go to the surface texture. What is the normal surface texture? When you talk about the normal surface texture, what you see is the stippling. Now, what is stippling? Now, stippling is 
the factors that are responsible for the stippling would include due to the attachment of the gingival fibers to the underlying bone and apart from that your stippling is nothing but a specialized adaptation or a reinforcement for function now your you know that your epithelium is drawn into retipex right similarly your connective tissue is put into finger like projections that is a papillary part of the connective tissue is put into finger like projections so your epithelial retipex and the finger like projections of your connective tissue that is your papillary they bind together and they bring about you know your connective tissue is entirely made out of fibers so these fibers have the tendency to pull your epithelium and these areas of surface elevations it creates areas of surface elevations and depressions and this is established as what is called as your stippling so in disease there will be loss of stippling in exudative chronic gingivitis the surface will look smooth and shiny how do you observe or how do you appreciate stippling as you take a moist cotton or a dry cotton and then you try to wipe the areas and where all do you look for stippling you look for stippling in your core of the interdental papilla and your uh, attached gingiva so you look for stippling in your attached gingiva and the core of the interdental papilla because the lateral margins of your interdental papilla are nothing but the continuations of your marginal gingiva and the central core of the interdental papilla is a continuation of your attached gingiva therefore you see stippling in your attached gingiva and because your core of the interdental papilla is a continuation of your attached gingiva you also find stippling that is Uh, uh, in the uh, stippling in even your core of your interdental papilla and one more property of the stippling it has been compared to that of an orange peel appearance you know how is an orange and the peel of an orange right the peel of an orange if you carefully notice you have some elevations and depressions so you have a similar kind of a pattern that you see in an orange peel to that of a stippling in your gingiva if you see fibrotic kind of a gingival enlargement the usually the surface texture would be firm and nodular in desquamative gingivitis there is complete peeling of your epithelium so epithelium is getting completely peeled off exposing your underlying connective tissue and then in hyperkeratotic conditions there is a leathery gin texture and the non inflammatory gingival hyperplasia you can have slightly nodular kind of a appearance in the surface texture we coming to the position of the gingiva the normal position of the gingiva is about 1 mm coronal to your cemento enamel junction okay and then factors which are responsible to keep it in position include the position of the tooth in the arch the root bone angle and then the mesiodistal curvature of the tooth surface and this is that in for example uh, uh, gingival recession your Uh, what is recession first let me tell you what is recession before we tell what happens in recession recession is nothing but your apical shift of your marginal gingiva thus leading to the exposure of the root surfaces so in case of gingival recession which is a diseased condition you have an apical migration so your gingival position would be apical to your cemento enamel junction in case of pseudo pockets you have that means to say and pseudo you, you have an enlargement condition wherein your gingival margin would be placed or positioned coronal to your much more coronal to your cemento enamel junction you can see the surface texture appreciate the surface texture that is a stippling which has been pointed with the arrows and stippling is absent in infants and it appears only at the age of 5 years and then again it decreases at old age okay and then it increases till adulthood and disappears at old age so we finished you have a uh, recession recession can be physiological recession or pathologic recession the physiologic recession can be associated with the age and the pathologic recession i told you it is because of the apical migration of the marginal gingiva exposing to the exposing the root surfaces again the recession can also be classified as the one which is visible and one which is hidden the one which is visible is the one where that is clinically observable and the one which is hidden is the one which is covered by the gingiva and can only be measured with a probe what is and then you can also have gingival recession which is localized to one tooth or it can be generalized to the entire dentition and then according to the position of the gingiva you can have an actual recession and you can have an apparent position the actual position is a level where your epithelial attachment on the tooth that is your from the cemento enamel junction to the probable pocket depth whereas your apparent position is a level of the crest of gingival margin that is from the cj till the gingival margin 
What is the clinical significance of gingival recession? It can produce, because of the exposure of the root surfaces, the patient can complain of dentinal hypersensitivity or he will get more prone to or susceptible to development of dental caries, especially your root caries. Apart from that, I told you sensitivity of the cementum. When the cementum is lost, it can expose the underlying dentine, leading to dentinal hypersensitivity. And this can spread through the dentinal tubules or the accessory canals and can cause a hyperemia of the pulp. Then plaque accumulation, there are high tendencies of plaque accumulation in the interproximal areas. Coming to the last uh, feature of the normal gingiva that is a ble bleeding on probing. If you see in a normal condition, there is the bleeding on probing is absent. Okay, only in the diseased conditions, it's always present. So always presence of bleeding on probing will indicate your stability of the periodontium. It doesn't indicate that the disease is present, but it gives you, it's a negative predictor of the disease, meaning to say it will predict that it, the periodontal status is stabilized. What are the factors responsible for bleeding on probing? First is an intact sulcular epithelium and normal capillaries. Whereas in your inflammatory conditions, the minute you do, you probe the entire sulcular area, you, you run the probe in the sulcus, it will lead to bleeding. Why? Because you know in inflammatory status, your, usually your blood vessels are engorged, they are dilated, and then there are increased proliferation of blood vessels and your sulcular epithelium might be slightly ulcerated. So thinning and ulceration of the sulcular epithelium along with with the uh, engorgement of the capillaries and the increased proliferation of the capillaries during your inflammatory process can provoke a bleeding on probing. What are the etiological factors for this bleeding on probing? You have local factors, you have systemic factors. You have local factors, the factors that cause acute bleeding and the factors that cause cause chronic or recurrent bleeding. The ones which cause acute bleeding are like toothbrush trauma or ribs and impaction of sharp pieces of the hard food like fish bones or you know a speck of an apple or gingival burns that are caused because of some hot food or a conditions like acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis. What are the reasons of cause causing chronic bleeding? Chronic bleeding can be because of any chronic inflammations, inflammatory conditions of the gingiva, that is your chronic gingivitis, or because of the presence of plaque and calculus, or else chronic periodontitis, or even aggressive periodontitis. All these conditions can cause a chronic bleeding, or any mechanical trauma, like toothbrush trauma, or because of use of toothpicks, or improper use of dental floss, food impaction, and then biting onto a solid object, such as apple. What are the systemic factors for causing bleeding? First thing can be any hemorrhagic disorders, either a defect in the bleeding uh, platelets or in a uh, number of platelets or even in the uh, uh, defects in the function of the platelets. So there can be some defects in the clotting mechanisms or maybe, the, uh, maybe a liver insufficiency, probably the patient is an alcoholic and appropriate uh, clotting factors are not released by the liver and this can lead to again bleeding conditions or any all these conditions or any uh, inherited conditions like your hemophilia. The bleeding can also occur in certain excessive administration of certain drugs like your anticoagulants. Okay, your anticoagulants, excessive ingestion of anticoagulants like your dicumarol and heparin can also cause excessive bleeding. Apart from that, NSAIDs, especially your aspirin, that is your salicylate, can cause excessive bleeding. And that ends your clinical features of gingivitis. Thank you.